Welcome, everybody, and thank you for tuning in to what will be the fifth in our series on countering the radical right with the Center for Analysis of the Radical Right. So over the course of this series, we've analyzed how extremism proliferates and the initiatives that can be pursued to combat it. But now we're going to get into the weeds a little bit, and we're going to discuss conspiracy theories, which is obviously a topic that we're all been consumed with lately. So um, we're going to talk about the role they play in extremist recruitment, how we can pull people out of those rabbit holes, and uh, essentially uh, this, how this has been used to just further and perpetuate radical right extremism. So to dive into this, we have the brilliant uh, Natalie James, who is an assistant professor of international relations at the University of Nottingham and the head of counter extremism research unit at the Center for Analysis of the Radical Right. Uh, Natalie, uh, how are you doing? I'm very good, thank you. How are you? I'm, I'm doing good. I'm excited for this conversation. Um, you know, we've been talking about various aspects of this. And I know in our previous conversation, we've talked about how to de-radicalize people. So I'm definitely excited to dive into that today. But let's just start by getting some background about you and the work you've done. Yeah, um, yeah, and thanks very much for having me. It is fantastic to be here and to follow a long line of colleagues who have done amazing jobs on their episodes as well. Um, so yeah, so as you say, I'm um, based at the University of Nottingham, um, but I completed my PhD last year. Um, and in that PhD, I focused on, um, so my concern really is around how we understand and conceptualize threat, what we see as a threat, who we see as a threat, uh, and therefore how we go about trying to counter that threat. So um, I focus on that that particular construction of threat on, a, on an everyday level. So, you know, how do people like you and me, how, what do we see as threatening, as well as on that kind of the macro level of what do policy elites, what a government saying is a threat and, and how does the, how do the two interact within one another? So of course that involves kind of, you know, everyday people, it involves policy, it involves media. So I, I kind of, I look at how all of that gets constructed and then how people go about saying, all right, well, if this is a threat then, what do we need to do to try and stop that? So a key part of what that has been is, is looking at, okay, well, in the UK context, how is threat understood to be countered there? And in what linking back to um, Sean, he had on a couple of weeks. So I use the prevent duty, which was the statutory element of what he was talking about. So that legal responsibility on uh, in the UK, members of the um, public sector. Their, their responsibility to identify and try and disrupt threat of extremism and terrorism from becoming something that was a danger to the public, danger to the UK. So my focus was on, okay, well, we've got this duty and what does that look like in practice? How do people understand threat in that, in that sense? And, and how are they going about countering it then on a day-to-day -day basis um, through direction of the government, but also by what else there? influenced by around them you know policy elites mm -hmm. people who are in government the media what they're reading online all that sort of stuff so for me that was then kind of trying to understand okay who is threatening what do we go what do we do when we see that threat how do we counter it how do we keep ourselves safe um, mm -hmm. and I did that within an education context so I looked at how that played out in the education sector in the UK mm -hmm. and what that meant on a day-to-day -day basis for um, colleges so colleges for us is kind of age 16 to 19 it's the in-between of what we call high school and university um, so that really critical age where people are, are really learning and finding their own identities and, and how do young people and how do their teachers respond to there's this wider threat of extremism and terrorism what does that look like and is there any of these students who are potentially vulnerable to that threat so the research was really trying to examine how do people interact with one another when you've got this duty on the one hand, but you've also got, you know, human beings in front of you who in one sense might well be becoming vulnerable to that exploitation and, and need protecting, need safeguarding. But on the other hand, you've also got this wider policy media discourse, which is kind of very securitized and, and has been predominantly focused on, let's face it, Islamist terrorism for, for since the war on terror era. So kind of seeing the challenge between those two and how that played out on the ground. Um, and that's kind of then got me into this interest around, all right, well, we've had this dominant view of terrorism being all about Islamist-inspired terrorists. And 
where does the far right fit into that especially as we've you know seen the perceived rise of the far right over the last sort of maybe you know in the UK context probably it's come into public sphere around the last seven eight years or so we can trace it way far further back than that but as a kind of a policy concern we've only started to see it coming through um recently so how did that then fit in and and, yeah. and more recently what I'm looking at going forward is exactly as some of the conversation is going to be about today where does conspiracy theory fit into that then and is conspiracy theory can we understand it in those same lenses is it something that we need to protect people against in the same sense that we're protecting people from far-right extremism yeah and it's, it's interesting as you talk about that that young age group right and I really think um, you know, when you when you've been analyzing this, and I, I know now your the interest is of course conspiracy theories because I think precisely as you say, uh, there, you know, it's not just the main focus has been on the security aspect and like yeah. the the counter extremism, the, the counter terrorism, countering the violence, but not necessarily the prevention, which of course the UK has done, but here in the US it is just about uh, how do we prevent the next attack, etc. But when, when you're seeing, when you were looking at that, that young group and what, you know, what vulnerabilities were there, um, did you see, you saw obviously conspiracy theories kind of popping up there, right, as, as one of the uh, things that might potentially um, lead to um, radical right extremism, they've kind of been used as recruitment, right? Yeah, so it, it's, a, it's a tricky one because you kind of got this, you've got this policy level discourse of here's what we should be looking for, here's the threat that is facing our young people. And then you've got kind of on the ground where, so part of my research was going into these education institutions and speaking to teachers, speaking to educationalists, speaking to students about, okay, you know, what do you see as the threat? How, you know, do you think that you're vulnerable to this? And, and what's, what do you know about the process of how you might be protected or you might protect somebody else against that? And, and interestingly enough, kind of explicitly conspiracy theories were never mentioned they were never touched on it wasn't something that was seen as um it certainly isn't something that's covered in the prevent legislation in terms of training around this is the sort of stuff you should be looking out for really um or it certainly wasn't at the time which was sort of finished field work around two years ago whether that's changed or not there's a potential my instinct is not from what i know about the, the, yeah. the people who still work in the field um but implicitly from a lot of the students, what you were hearing was their concern was more around some of that conspiracy theories that were starting to come through on the Internet, particularly, and that they were aware that other people were engaged with and how that actually fed into sort of this wider uh, narrative that was going on at the time in the UK. And, and it still does to this day and, and is impacted, of course, we've seen in the US, we've seen across Europe of what I term exclusionary politics of this idea of who is an acceptable person, what is an acceptable identity, and how everybody else outside of that is the other, is the enemy. Yeah. So explicitly, conspiracy theories never really came up, but actually when you dug down into what people were talking about, they were very much tapping into what we've now seen in the last sort of two years, particularly with the rise of QAnon, was this idea that, you know, the kind of potential corruption of the elite and these, and it wasn't that these students to you know just to be really clear it wasn't that these students were sort of echoing these narratives it's that they were acutely aware that that is what existed out there and that there was a concern that potentially some of that was creating really hostile environments mm -hmm. for that there was a potential that that then had the the, the potential to create extremism and, and violence and you know and and disputes and, and divides between communities so it was really interesting in that respect how it was the students who really were picking up on on the dangers of conspiracy theories at the time yeah, yeah because especially you know um people of uh, you know the, our, our younger generation are able to see that conspiratorial thinking really took began to take off in the 21st century even more given the access to information the access to social media um the various conspiracy theory films and especially given the fact that government you know we had the uh, what we discussed in the other episodes like we had the iraq war right so there was an actual lie where that sowed a lot of distrust so that people could then, and, and now what we're seeing is when it comes to this like surge of conspiratorial thinking, you're right, it's interesting that you say there was no implicit, there was no explicit statement of the, oh, it's conspiracy theories driving this because when you actually think about it, um, racism itself and white supremacy and extremism are conspiracy theories themselves. You know, you need that conspiratorial thinking in order to rationalize 
the vast great replacement that is coming and all these other things that come. It's like, you need to, that's why these, with the surge of QAnon, um, have you seen that that has played a role in, do you think it's correlated with this surge in extremism generally with, with this broader rise of conspirat conspiratorial thinking? Yeah. Almost certainly. Yeah. I mean, and it, I, I don't think it can be blamed in isolation. It can't be kind of, you know, like it's not the, the sole reason for it. It's not a sole driver of it, but it's, and that's what I was talking about this kind of politics of exclusion. We've allowed almost this, um, I, Mario talked about it in his episode um, last week. And he said about, you know, it's this idea of relative deprivation and, and relative loss of, you know, loss of power right. and, and that sort of thing. It, it's, it all feeds into this idea that people I, I, you know, whether rightly or wrongly, are feeling disgruntled by the situation that they're in, and these conspiracy theories are feeding into that existing narrative of disillusionment, of grievances, of, you know, of not believing the state, of not believing the the lies that we have been told by the state, and so they they play a really crucial role. They don't play a role on them on their own. Yeah. But they do feed into that wider narrative almost certainly. And especially when you've got kind of this, this rising sense of not only nationalism, but let's face it, ethno-nationalism and uh, of what it can only be described as white nationalism, particularly, you know, the US. And it, and it is certainly evident in the UK as well. And without that context, I'm not quite sure conspiracy theories would have latched on the way that they have. But equally, conspiracy theories have almost driven some of that to enter the mainstream in the way that they have because I think it's perhaps in the way that say you know the great replacement theory is not going to be believable to everybody not everyone is going to latch onto that sort of extreme side of potentially some of these ideas that are linked with um, far-right extremism but they certainly play on the fears of those who are not necessarily convinced by that but it's tapped into something in their head that has played on that fear that they have and the conspiracy theories I think have allowed people who are potentially on the very very fringes who are never going to be the ones who are radicalized by the extreme right right but they're the ones who are taken in by some of the narratives that we see in the radical right and mm. conspiracy theories have perhaps created that path that has enabled some of them to maybe get involved in some places but even where they haven't it's allowing them to lie on the fringes of the narratives that are wholly embedded in in far-right extremism yeah that that's very well put because what we're kind of seeing now especially with QAnon is I always call it the old country buffet of uh, conspiracy theories. No offense to old country buffet, but you go in there and there's just, you can pick and choose what you want to believe in. And I know yeah. so many people who will believe they, there are people who are falling down the QAnon conspiracy theory rabbit hole and don't even know that they're falling down the rabbit hole. They, they believe in little bits and pieces of it, but what it always ends up coming, especially in, you know, as we know, I'm sure you've seen Q into the storm by now and, um, potentially because Ron Watkins, I'm very convinced he might be Q uh, because it's essentially they were just really feeding into all these existing divisions, these existing skepticisms, these existing uh, perceptions that the elite is out to get them, that no expert, no one of prominence can be trusted. They're all in on it. They're all, you know, everything is connected. There's, you know, Trump would tweet out a capital letter and they uh, of a certain like accidentally capitalized something and they would take it as code and it, it was just once people started to go down the QAnon rabbit hole we started to see it turned it pretty much blatantly pro-Trump and if you're blatantly pro-Trump one of the the big pieces of Trump's movement is blatant white nationalism mm. so it, like it's it was almost as if QAnon was just giving these white supremacists just uh an email list essentially or you know like a just a list of people to target for recruitment like people on 8chan the people who may have entered a, a mommy blog or facebook group because they they wanted to combat ch child trafficking and then they end up believing that hollywood elites are sucking the life elixir from young people yeah and like you know don't get me wrong that whether we agree with some of the views or not, right? 
people have what they believe to be legitimate concerns around corrupt elites, around governments who are just blatantly lying to us, around immigration levels, around um, you know, child sexual exploit exploitation. We might not always agree with those concerns that people have, and we, you know, but to them they are legitimate concerns. We do not have the right to tell them that they are wrong. The issue that we've got is when, exactly as you say, people are out there trying to do, trying to have legitimate conversations again whether we agree with the out with the, their view on them or not they yeah. are trying to have these legitimate conversations about i'm concerned at the rising number of immigrants in my community and the divisions that that's causing now the root of that is a whole other question and is a whole yeah. other issue but th that is then picked up on by the wrong people and yeah. you've got people like q and taking mass advantage of that situation and then feeding in these other ideas, which are, you know, without question, they are complicit to feeding far right ideology. Exactly right. And, you know, just on, on that note, when you're talking about how a lot of the time these are valid concerns that some people have, um, there might be their economic status has diminished. Uh, they're like, especially during the pandemic, people were just okay. stuck at their houses staring at their laptops. And if you don't have media literacy, you're and the world is crumbling around you, you might, you might end up falling into these rabbit holes. And so a lot of the time, I think you're right. It's not, it's in order, to, you don't start and say your concern isn't legitimate, legitimate, you know, you probably start by saying your concern is legitimate, but Tucker Carlson's lying to you about this being a conspiracy theory to replace your whiteness. So, you know, like, but and on that note, I mean, obviously, that's not the most eloquent way to put it to somebody, mm -hmm. but you and your experience with counter extremism programs, have you uh, what tactics have you seen work in kind of uh, convincing some of these people, walking them back off the edge of these conspiracy theories uh, and, and, you know, kind of pulling them out of it? Have you seen a specific uh, way in which to approach these conversations? Yeah, so I, I think what's really interesting is that we haven't yet seen any research that's been done that on conspiracy theories about that sort of that that return back um and um secret we are trying to push on it um we are trying to get some research that does exactly that but i think there's really important lessons that can be taken from from counter extremism policies in general in that exactly as you said that the it is not about the most important thing is they're not about telling someone that they are wrong it's not about telling someone that they they don't have the right to think that the way the way that we did they do the uk and the us both have you know think of the first amendment we we have freedom of speech as well you just because we don't agree with someone doesn't mean that we can silence them and tell them that they're wrong it's about but you know but equally like views need to be challenged if they are wrong but it's about creating dialogue and space for meaningful dialogue as opposed to simply preaching to someone okay you think that boy you should think this you should think this they should think this that's not going to work those they these concerns need engaging with in a manner in which you can talk they can talk with someone who is a trusted figure someone who is related to them that's really important there's no point in bringing in a government official or someone who they see who, who is linked to the authority. Well, they, that's just going to push them further away, particularly if you've all, also got someone yeah. who's already anti kind of government in the first place. The, it's, you are fighting a losing battle there. Yeah. Um, but creating that sort of that, that space for meaningful dialogue where it is exactly as you say, you know, it's, it's about saying not even necessarily all oh, this person is feeding you lies but actually saying well where do you think that that comes from what do you think is the root of this and actually here's some facts or figures here's some anecdotes from and stories of people and actually saying this is actually where it comes from and this is perhaps one way you could go about doing it and that's the other kind of potentially the a key lesson that can be taken from extremism agendas is providing people with a a meaningful outlet for their concerns it's not about silencing them even if you get to a point you know where you have convinced someone that they were wrong for whatever reason by going through that process they still have the right to be able to air a concern it's not about silencing in that respect it's about providing them with a, a, an alternative outlet that isn't one that leads to necessarily violence or isn't one that leads to hatred um that actually allows them to engage with what was at the root cause of their disgruntlement and grievance and concern 
And is there a way that we can address that? It might be, you know, which is where kind of that's where what prevent does in that what Sean was talking about in trying to deal with some of those socioeconomic grievances or provide mental health um, support. I think the issue that we run into with doing a, a, a like for like comparison when it comes to counter extremism to conspiracy is that the a lot of the agendas and a lot of the programs that work on counter extremism will identify the people that they want to engage with on a basis of what's the potential of violence here what's the potential threat of violence right that isn't always the case with conspiracy because not all conspiracies will lead to or encourage violence but violence isn't all the you know there's other things that are as just as dangerous as violence like yeah. hatred is just as dangerous as violence yeah. because of the way that it can manifest itself just because somebody isn't going to go out there and potentially you know kill someone doesn't mean that they are not going to do a similar level of psychological or you know, even even physical harm in an alternative ways mm -hmm. by preventing someone from being able to go about their life because of the hatred that they have and a lot of the counter extremism programs that exist prevent being one of them that Sean discussed will kind of only take that individual on where there is a potential for or threat of violence. And I don't think that that can work in the spaces of conspiracy because we need to take even more steps back and say, all right, but that can still lead to hatred. It can still lead to damages to political systems. You know, what's the effect of, on democracy? The, you know, the US has, has seen that very clearly in capital. Yeah, yeah. Like, so, so how how do we respond to that? And I, I'm not sure that counter extremism offers all of the answers. Yeah. In terms of the, what currently exists, because how do you deal with that potential damage on democracy? There's so many points that you touched on. I'm going to kind of hit them in, in order there because I think like the beginning part of that when it comes to the just the general approach of confronting the conspiracy theories directly because I think our uh, listeners are interested in this too. Um, because they do it every day in their day-to-day -day lives because it's everywhere, right? It's, one, it's yeah. one of those things where while we might not see a white supremacist or extremist in a telegram group um, next, you know, next to us all the time, like we see them, they operate in secret. We see these conspiracy theories on our feeds, social media feeds and our families and our friends every day. And one of the things that I thought that you said that was, that was really important was that you, you, you don't just, you kind of start to ask questions and you kind of start to get them to, think through what it is. And I know people say facts, like you've mentioned facts and figures. Some people say that doesn't work when you throw it at people. But what I've found is that it's about the trust factor. And it's about, because like you said, you can't just bring in, or you shouldn't just say, all right, I'm going to sit down with my friend. Here's random government official with me now. <laughs> We're going to de-radicalize you. You have to kind of discuss. And from conversations that have worked with me and, and some of my uh, peers in the past is when I'm in a confrontational stance or they can tell I think that they're stupid or they can tell I think that they're not thinking through what they're doing and I feel and I'm giving off vibes it's different than when I present them facts and figures while I'm asking questions and kind of validating that they what they that they do believe in what they believe in and their general concern might be true but the route they're taking isn't right so do you think just on, on a one-on-one -on -one basis, that's kind of the right approach, right? To kind of not just yell at them and call them stupid, but do it again, give them the, 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 way, the window to start to self-de-radicalize because they did, in fact, self-radicalize. Yeah, definitely. And, and, you know, there isn't a one kind of one solution to this. And, and again, you know, I, I think the reality of somebody doing that once and then that person going, oh, okay, yeah, at the end of an hour conversation is very slim. But I think that the, a repeated instance of that, and again, not in kind of a prescribed, like, I'm going to sit down with you every Thursday at three o'clock <laughs> and we're going to have this conversation. Yeah. But, I, I, but I do think that there is something really important with a trusted person. And whether that is family or friends or whether it's somebody who is... Um, you know, just known to them in, in a wider community on a local level, or even someone who they feel that they look up to, you know, there's potentially something to be said by key figures of, of notoriety or, you know, celebrity status, if we want to call it that, mm -hmm. of people who they would look up to have just kind of 
almost creating the spaces where those challenges might be had and that raises questions in people's minds. Now, you have those conversations with someone who is perpetuating and who is, you know, on these sites and these forums doing this 24 seven, this, this is not going to work, right? Because they are rehearsed, they, are, they have orchestrated, they, they will know exactly what to say and they will keep saying the same thing over and over and again. You are not going to break through with people on that level, right? But you probably are going to break through with people who, like I said, are the ones who aren't convinced by, you know, they, they, they're not sort of proponents of the great replacement theory per se but they've latched onto some elements of QAnon that have then kind of some of this ideology has started teasing its way in those are the sorts of people who on that one-to-one -one basis who may well be the individuals who uh actually oh okay that's raised a bit of a question in my head am, am I right in what I've said I might go out and do a bit of research in it and it might be that process or it might be a case of you know that it does take those questions several times to do it but I think there's a real importance in allowing that individual co to come to that process themselves, whether that takes an hour, whether it takes two years to do that. The, the individual has to have an acceptance. They have to accept that they have come to that decision on their own, not that they've been forced into it. Because at that point, you are, you, you bite, you are you're fighting fire with fire because they, they're not, you're just feeding into the same rhetoric that they've been told that, oh, you've been told this all your life and it's false. Exactly. They have to come to that decision on their own. Precisely. Yeah. And I think, you know, speaking of that uh, on that point, because what you're saying is, yeah, I mean, it's certain it's not just going to take one conversation. They're not going to be like, you know what? You're right. I'm going to just completely throw out the stuff I've been believing in for the past year out the window. But it's kind of a sustained effort. And it's kind of something that will involve uh, people that they believe they believe in, they trust in, that they see as role models coming in. And on, on that note, you mentioned how and prevent and, you know, in your last statement that there is this focus on potential for violence, this focus on let's interfere only when the extremism turns to violence, because you're right, there's a range here. There's, you know, there's falling down the beginning of the QAnon funnel. You're not necessarily an extremist. You're just kind of biting on some Facebook links. And then there's that where you slowly begin to crescendo towards that extremism. So when it comes to, do you think it's possible to, to have a, a kind of counter conspiracy theory uh, effort at scale, as opposed to one that's mostly counter extremism, as opposed to them, because they're because they're really there's levels to it, and we can't group all of them into one being. So, do you think that that a counter conspiracy theory uh, broader campaign or program is is possible, especially in the United States, given our constitutional protections? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really difficult one because there's multiple levels that you can look at it, right? So you can look at it on a basis of is the responsibility is there a responsibility of um, the the people in power, whether that be at government level, whether that be in media circles, whether that be in um, kind of law enforcement, is there a responsibility on them? to when they see these conspiracies to tackle them head on whether again you know we're talking about deplatforming we're talking about um counter narratives being directly put into people through mapping systems online whether we're talking about you know individuals being held responsible and accountable when they are clearly perpetuating very very hateful narratives that are that feed into this right so there's there is a question on whether that is appropriate whether it's possible i think that yes it probably is appropriate and possible mm. to some degree but that's it's this question of so take deplatforming for example that is great and and you know people have had this conversation on this these episodes before that's great because it it removes some of that content but all it takes is someone to do a new twitter name right to yeah. move on to a different platform so you're potentially chasing the same ideology the same person over and over so I think you've also got to then go to another level of this community basis where you you're doing exactly what we just said then about you know that that one to one intervention, but potentially even go even further and think about the role of education in media literacy in critical thinking, and that potentially then does map all of those things and does recognise the development that you might get from going from these fringe conspiracy theories that let's face it are entering the mainstream very very easily on a day to day basis but do have the potential to exactly you know the analogy you use go down that rabbit hole and and potentially 
and, and you know enable someone to go into propensity for violence so it's really important then that we're trying to encourage people to or, and to give people the skills to be able to question the stuff that's pre presented in front of them whether that be you know by a policy elite whether it be by someone on the internet on a forum or, or social media or whether it be even you know someone in the street let's face it this doesn't all happen on the online space this is happening in communities on the ground on a day-to-day -day basis to be able to give people the skills and educate them to be able to say oh hang on a minute i'm not going to take that at face value i might have a conversation with you about it and ask some more questions and know how to ask those questions i might go away and have a have a, a search online and see what i can find out myself or you know even not to that extent to be able to just get say i'm not quite sure that's true and therefore i'm not going to take it at face value and and i can leave it there and until we start embedding that in an education system then i think that we're never going to get to the root issue of trying to tackle how let's face it how very very bloody clever these people are at tapping into some of the narratives and the fears that exist and until people start to know how to question that yeah. you, 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 we are we are completely fighting a losing battle against it i completely agree i mean i could not agree more on the education front because that really is the root especially here in the u.s when it it just has not evolved with the times i mean uh, we should be teaching the kids uh, to, especially like I, I propose like a homeroom class where it's just media literacy period. And you're just kind of teaching people how to navigate the day-to-day -day headlines, show what sources are credible, how to discern facts from reality, uh, give the context to, to various uh, situations, show the tactics that are used by conspiracy theorists and recruiters um, and, and extremist groups to tap into this. And I think you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be like a, a branded thing in which we're like countering conspiracy theories, because obviously the right will weaponize that and act like we're attacking right wing ideology. It's just a robust investment in a Internet age education uh, curriculum. And I think that really gets to the root of it. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, just to, to kind of bring it back full circle to what I was talking about at the very beginning, my own research. So prevent the in terms of the duty the statutory responsibility that it implies on education systems is that um, and it's slightly different in education than it is to all of the public sectors in that it's not only this responsibility to spot vulnerability and refer it but actually they've got a responsibility to embed uh, kind of this idea of resilience building and critical thinking they have they, that is part of the duty right now the issue is is that is all well and good and exactly as we've just said how important that is but they're not given the time and space and resource to do that. So this is the biggest issue that I have with, with what would be, in my view, the best way to tackle these issues and, and to see that mapping from the potential of conspiracy theories. But, you know, even if you even go further back than that, even just questioning what a politician is telling you, should I be believing this? You know, at that very basic level, all the way right through to these people who are harmful, who are going to try and radicalise and exploit people who are in, you know, potentially going through an awful lot and are seeking out community and belonging and are being exploited, right? But until you provide educationalists with the space, the time, the resource to actually be able to embed this into curriculums, that's not going to happen. And in the UK, that is not happening. So teachers are told that, you know, building critical thinking skills, make your students resilient to these sorts of messaging and to these individuals who might exploit them. When are they meant to do that? Well, they get given 45 minute tutorial sessions once a week when they also have to build in things against um, sexual health, mental health, um, grooming, drug and alcohol abuse, um, financial advice on you know how to find a job so there's all these different things that they consider these life skills but they're given 45 minutes a week to do it well how do you have those meaningful conversations about deconstructing narratives right about being aware of political events people in the uk we don't have political education is a choice it's it's an option when you get to like age 16 17 18 right how on earth are you meant to make people aware of the the system that they exist within if they have no idea about it the only people who are going to know are people who come from politically minded families so education for me is 100 percent the answer 
but the issue with it lies not in the education system it lies in the political systems that do not provide the education systems with the resources and the time that they need Precisely. to do these to do these types of activities exactly and honestly i think one of the one of the biggest legislative priorities that should be taken um, period of cost across all governments essentially especially the uk and the us is a huge just education package like that we were talking infrastructure we're talking all these other things yeah climate change is obviously number one here um given ex the existential nature of it um voting rights all these other things but we need a complete revamp refunding retooling uh reinvention of the way we approach education and the way we invest in it because like you said 45 minutes a week to to tackle these you know life skills it, why isn't that kind of what schooling's about right like you you school's supposed to prepare you for life not give you a bunch of useless information right not useless yeah. obviously it's, it's it has use you know i'm not that you know you're an academic and you know you you know the value of of schooling and and you using information but i think it throws a lot of information at people without telling them how you use this information practically how you can discern uh fact from fiction how you can critically think also how you can deal with adversity uh i'm not saying we need a therapist we, we could have a therapist but in psychology you know well, I, I took a psychology class in high school and it, it talked through all the concepts of psychology and you know broadly i learned about freud you know i learned about all this mm -hmm. stuff but it didn't spend much time talking about our individual psychology and how we should grapple with the adversities of life you know i felt like we'd have less mass shootings if that was just a simple thing that was told to a young impressionable kid that felt that you know they, they didn't know their way right so i think i think i'm glad this conversation moved to, to education because people investing in education is a counter extremism counter conspiracy theory tool uh it's and and it's just been kind of overlooked almost it's like we just kind of let it be and not evolve it to the the status it needs to be and i know that's a problem in the us but you're saying obviously clearly it's a big problem in the uk as well yeah and it's a frustrating one because it on the surface, the UK looks as though it's doing a lot in education through the prevent duty, right? And it is frustrating because that isn't, it isn't playing out on the ground as it should. And you've got a situation where the students I talked to were crying out for the opportunity to talk about this. And they, exactly as you said, you know, they link things like terrorism and extremism, they link it to the same sort of knowledge and critical thinking that's needed to deal with issues like climate change, that's needed to deal with issues like homelessness, that are all really important issues to them, but they're not given the time and the opportunity to talk about them in school. And yet school for them is that safe place where they can have those conversations. And then you've got teachers on the other hand who are kind of almost they they know that this is what students want, they know it's what students need, but they're prevented from being able to offer that opportunity for discussion because they're trying to make sure that they've hit whatever criteria that they need to, to make, get students to pass an exam, to get, so we have a, a regulatory system called Ofsted, who come and inspect all education institutions to make sure that they're performing to certain levels. Mm -hmm. Prevent duty falls into one of that, so they have to evidence that they're performing uh, statutorily to their duty. And when you've got this kind of tick box system, um, you're asking, teachers to deal with so many different agendas as well as actually being teachers that they just can't how are they meant to do that so then it does raise that question of all right well what else is needed within the education system and in the uk we've seen kind of cutbacks that a lot of party well a few of the participants i spoke to who were um uh, senior levels of like the safeguarding teams were saying you know we used to have counselors in who would have been the perfect people when that threat to violence wasn't enough to get prevent support for that individual, but there were still concerns there. Rather than a teacher trying to deal with it or a safeguarding lead trying to deal with something they didn't fully understand, actually, that youth service member or that counsellor would have been the perfect person in that situation, in the trusted school environment, to be able to supply them with the, the support that they needed alongside a critical education system that was providing them with the skills to be able to engage in those conversations. 
So on the surface, the UK is doing a really a kind of a, a seemingly positive step forward. Well, a huge positive step forward from the securitization and suspicion days of post 9-11, right? Mm -hmm. In turning this into a safeguarding mission. But that just isn't playing out as it needs to in the education system. And there's a lot of critics of, and I kind of I came from that place myself, you know, I would put myself as a very on the fringes, but as a relative critical scholar uh, and a critical person who looks at prevent. But not because I see it as the same thing as what it was years ago in a post 9-11 context, because what it's trying to be, it's not actually allowing itself to be. The people who are trying to implement that on a day to day basis aren't having the opportunity to do what they should be doing because of a wider system that is failing to provide them with the means to be able to do that. So you've kind of we've got this counter extremism policy that's really expanded itself into being in theory what it should be. But in practice, that wider system is just thinking, oh, well, we can throw this as long as we've got a counter extremism policy. That's fine. And that works. But on the ground, unfortunately, it doesn't. It needs all of those other things building in around it that is just being completely ignored. So in a US context, great. If we're going to, you know, mm -hmm. if Biden is really trying to work towards this targeting violent extremism and political violence, fantastic. But that needs to be embedded in a much wider system or it's not going to work. You're going to face the same issues that the UK did. Precisely. And, you know, we talked a lot about this with, with Sean and for viewers, if you haven't seen it, go back and look at episode three of great episode with, with Sean on, on the prevent system. But uh, what I will say is it's it, this kind of brings to mind something actually that Sean did say uh, was the fact that the, the prevent you look at the prevent budget and it's, you know, few millions of you know tens ten or so or uh, in the tens of millions and then you look at the counterterrorism budget and it's significantly higher and i feel like that's the same situation kind of happening here in, in 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 the u.s where there's so much being spent on you know the military and counterterrorism and law enforcement and all of these like these things of after the fact let's catch mm. the criminals after the fact let's catch the uh, terrorists after they've already gone down these rabbit holes and then there is nothing not nothing a smaller amount being invested in making sure that we create the greatest potential members of society mm -hmm. like the education system should be the number one it should be the mo the most well-funded part of uh society uh aside from of course there's there's healthcare and these other initiatives but one of the most important things about is the, that's the biggest opportunity to make sure you create an entire uh population of of law-abiding, productive members of society, and we just like let it be, and we don't, we don't, we don't put, we don't put those tools into play. That, that like you said, like I think prevent prevents definitely on the right path there. When you say, you know, the fact that that's even in in the education, we have nothing like that here, and and here, mm -hmm. it's because school is so localized, uh, and there's not, there's not, there are international, they're, they're not international, there are federal standards, but each state just does whatever they want with these textbooks and i grew up in virginia and i, I mentioned this in a previous uh episode but you know one of my college professors told me you know and the kid next to me that we should be proud of what our ancestors did even though of course i'm not a descendant of slaves but you know just the just, ignorance. The, just the ignorance and the fact that every locality is able to do whatever they kind of want and i'm not and obviously if I even propose this or even say this, people on the right would try to claim that you're trying to be a communist nation, you're trying to be like China, you're trying to create a monolithic federal system. Well, I that's not the case. It's trying to it's trying to create positive members of society in which where what state you grew up in doesn't doesn't impact your level of success or knowledge of the world around you. Now the Republicans in the US are targeting critical race theory. Uh, mm -hmm. And essentially, now they're kind of going beyond that and just essentially targeting the way we teach slavery, essentially, in the way that they're going about this um, and learn, trying to limit what can be said. We're going the opposite direction that the UK is in the prevent uh, side. So on that note, before I just continue ranting and get, getting angry about this, because <laughs> I really, you know, it, this rightly is, so, right? <laughs> like, it's just so obvious what we need to do. And there's just a certain part segment of the population and lawmakers 
that are just holding us back from doing this because this is education is really the key. So um, on the, on that note, in regards to just kind of the, uh, the the practical recommendations that you could give to you know the Biden administration, for example, this would probably be one of them, right? Uh, when it comes to countering these conspiracy theories. So obviously education is a big piece. And what other parts? What other suggestions would you bring? Yeah, and, and just kind of just a, a little bit to add on to that. I'm not even sure if we need to, I mean, don't get me wrong. I don't know if it's, well, I, yeah, I know it's the same, but if you shove it, crouch it in a counter extremism bubble, suddenly you get more funding for it, right? Um, yeah. So, I, but I'm not even sure you need to do that with education. I'm not even sure you need to be able to link the two. For me, they, they go hand in hand. Like you educate people to be critical thinkers. You're not going to end up with people who are absorbed by these ideologies in the same way that we're seeing now. I'm not going to say it's not going to happen, but to the extent, I, I don't believe that, that those two things are, are, are separate. But that that could even that just needs to happen on its own exactly. because that's how we've seen this sort of, what I referred to earlier is this idea of exclusionary politics. That's how we've seen this rise of acceptability of hatred and, um, you know, and division and and, and anti other in general. So that can exist in and of itself. But for me, yeah, it is a hand in hand with counter extremism um, approaches. I think as other people have said on this series, I think that you know, social media platforms have got a role to play. They have. They exist, the, the narratives exist on and offline, but they are, they're accelerated by the online spaces, they're accelerate, accelerated by the ability for the transnationalism of these ideas. And I think maybe that latches onto something else as well, which I know has been mentioned, that I, I, people are viewing this in isolation. And it's a difficult one here, because I kind of have two, two heads on it in that People are, are, are seeing these issues as completely in isolation of one another and being, well, you know, extremism is this and this is all it is and it exists in this bubble and it deals with these people. Terrorism is something that's different. Again, you know, we, we see that with this idea of domestic terrorism really not even being a, that much of a thing in the US, whereas it's more like domestic extremism and international terrorism. And, and that, to some extent, that rhetoric is, is replicated in the UK. And that, for me, is problematic in and of itself. You're almost creating this hierarchy of violence and that somehow this extremism isn't quite as bad as the 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 isis's of the world right they they're, they're different they're not comparable but they're certainly equally as dangerous in different ways and i think that that's an issue in the, the way that we define the way that we describe and the way that we treat that we have to recognize that yes extremism is can be different to terrorism right but there's overlaps as well we need to treat them differently in which is where I'm kind of saying I have two heads on this. We need to treat them separately, but we also need to see the relationship between them. And I don't think there's enough of that going on. I don't think there's enough of this idea that it is transnational, that, you, that you, governments can't deal with this. And, and even on a state-by-state -state basis, you can't deal with that in isolation because it doesn't exist like that. It's influenced and it influences mm -hmm. on a global scale. So the the federal system in one way works against it as that and, and you, you said it yourself they're going to come up with huge challenges against that because it will be this whole you know oh we want to create this one marxist state and and everybody is treated the same and you know in a problematic way and yeah but the reality is that this isn't going to work unless we have these global actors almost which is where for me the social media companies do come in in recognizing that it maps across and and until you start dealing with this on a trans national basis again we're not going to do much there's no point in having controls in one country that are completely out in another country because then you're just going to get it's still going to happen anyway so that's a kind of there's a, a few different bits in that but that for me is one key issue that needs dealing with um and then i think the and this is the this is probably absolutely impossible right but for me there is a huge issue in that political elites need to take responsibility and accountability for not only what they are currently saying but for what has happened previously yeah. and one of the biggest reasons prevent in the uk still faces the criticism it does is yes you know some people do still find it incredibly problematic and I, i'm not here to say that they are wrong but prevent has significantly changed from what it was but it it hasn't had the opportunity to demonstrate the level of change 
because none of the political elites have taken ownership and responsibility for its failings in the first place. They have not stood up and said, do you know what? We were wrong. This is what this caused. We are sorry for that. And we are going to make a change and we are going to make sure that that does not happen again. It's almost been kind of shoved under the carpet that the vast majority of the Muslim population in the UK were viewed with suspicion. Yeah. And as a result of that, you know, we still have these discourses that still view Muslims with suspicion in the UK and, and you know, and across other countries as well, the, the US including, right? But until political elites start taking responsibility, they are never, ever going to be trusted that they are in it for making meaningful change. So that is potentially a kind of a complete... You know, never going to happen scenario but for me there is a real issue in that and until they do start taking responsibility and accountability and admit that what has happened before has been wrong you're never ever going to get the trust of people to believe in what you're saying going forward i'm glad you brought that up because that's precisely one of the uh things that needs to happen here in the u.s especially because um what, one of the problems that we're having here is that um the republican party essentially is not only refusing to acknowledge the, uh, the, the trials and tribulations in American history, but they are perpetuating outright conspiracy theories just everywhere, right? So right now the big lie and the lie the election was stolen has consumed the Republican party. The majority believe the election was stolen. The majority believe Trump is the, the, the so they're, they're refusing to acknowledge history, acknowledge the past, um, America's history, their own personal, uh, complicity in inciting the insurrection period and then now they're continuing it and they're using the this lie as the basis for legislation and undemocratic pushes mm -hmm. so it's one of those things where and then there's also right-wing media that's just perpetuating all of this on these networks completely and, so, and social media accelerating that so i mean it's how do we Obviously, the voters can can hold these people accountable, but then there's one party in base being corrupted as we speak. So how how do you see us uh, even addressing beginning to address that here in the U.S.? Because I know in the U.K. there are problems as well, but in the U.S. we're we're in we're in some trouble. So what yeah, you're about? in deep with it. <laughs> I, I it's, it's, it almost feels like an impossible task right it feels as though you are literally banging at a wall that is never ever going to fall down um i'm i don't know i you know I, i'm not an expert in american politics i don't genuinely believe that everybody in the republican party believes in that idea and i'm not saying that they're not going along with it because that's a very different thing i think group think is a huge thing and as a and you've got a situation with the Republican Party where if someone's going to stand up against their own party, they are going to be absolutely slated and never supported again, particularly at the moment. It's a, a toxic, toxic environment. I maybe it's the, the the kind of the hopeful human in me that I wonder if if a few people start standing up against that, that they may well then be those those trusted voices that I was talking about before to be like oh, okay, maybe I don't need to go along with everybody else in it. I think that that's potentially a kind of a hope in the sky that we might think that or hope that could come along eventually that could have some sort of domino effect on that. But I think for the here and now, I think there's an issue in the, the relationship between the, the toxicity that's existing within the Republican Party and the media channels, as you rightly pointed out then, is a, is a huge problem. But equally... You know, Ashton mentioned it when she was talking about these big platforms claiming that they're going to that they're, they're trying to get all of this accountability and we need more regulation. They're not going to meaningfully go for that. They're not going to put money into that because they're going to lose money overall. And I, I don't see these media companies doing anything similar to, to, to regulate themselves in the way that, you know, accountability and transparency should be had through through media companies. They shouldn't be allowed to to spout lies and to spout to regurgitate conspiracy theories that are incredibly damaging and, and are a huge threat to democracy, not only to individuals, but to, to democracy as a whole. Yeah. And I don't know how, you know, I, I completely honestly, I just don't know how we tackle 
those massive media corporations who are then providing the platform for those politicians, but those politicians are providing the 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 acceptable the acceptableness of spouting those those views and i i don't know how we deal with that because i i can't see a way around it until we end up in a position where to either we've we've changed the mindsets at a, a population level or we've we've provided the population with the ability to challenge those narratives that exist and and the call comes from the bottom up or we're in a situation where the Biden administration take the step forward and, and somehow get through, which again is kind of a, an almost impossible, but somehow get through legislation which does require media platforms to be more accountable and more responsible when they are espouting ideas and stories and narratives that are not only false, but harmful. If that was to happen from the top down, then I think there's more chance that then, you know, those same platforms can't do the same to the extent that they're doing. They can't then provide the platform for the politicians. And there's a potential way to break it down there. There's a potential way to break it from the bottom up. The reality of that happening, I'm not particularly hopeful for on either either way, which maybe is a grim way to, to end that question. But yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're right, because it's really it's it's I think it should be multifaceted. Right? I think it should be both, in my opinion. I think there's obviously not that much that can be done from the top down. I mean, there is some regulation you can put in place. I think there's no reason. I think there should be strikes on, I, I think it, it, you don't have to infringe on First Amendment, but potentially strikes mm -hmm. that are put on your broadcast license every time you have a successful libel lawsuit. Like o, yeah. OAN and Newsmax should not be, I should not, they should not be on our cable. Like they're, they're part of our cable packages for some. That's the thing. How have they got to mainstream positions? It, 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 it's, they're a legit. Newsmax and, I mean, Fox News is blended, but Newsmax and OAN specifically are straight fake news. They will, they will perpetuate blatant fake news and disinformation. And there, there's something that has to be done there um, on that front, the licensing front on the media companies. There's obviously maybe tweaks to Section 230 that can be made that don't, you know, fully infringe on their ability to you know, protect the, not be responsible for all speech, but just take greater responsibility. But I think mainly the most, the biggest shifts we see are cultural shifts. Like those are obviously, like you said, top down, bottom down, bottom up, right? Yeah. Just that ability. The only way the Republican party itself is gonna change and the base, um, well, I don't know if the base will change. They're just gonna, we're just gonna have to see how that goes. But the only way the, the leadership remains the same because they think they can win. For some, they just lost both cha all chambers, all yeah. positions of power, but they somehow think that they can win through rigging elections with the fear voter suppression bills in the future. So that's why they've latched on to the big lie. I think really the only way to change the Republican Party from the bottom up is to just, and, I've, and I'm not even like a, this isn't coming from a partisan. I'm not a Democratic activist. I don't work for the Biden administration or any Democrat, but in order for Republicans to turn back to sanity, I just think they have to be repeatedly defeated at the yeah. ballot box. It's the only way. The only thing that they read is power. So if you just could repeatedly destroy them at the ballot box and they just continuously just get beaten, 2022, 2024, 2026, 2028, you know, eventually they're going to yeah. say, you know what? Okay, We're, we've been playing to an angry, regressive, uh, a lot of the times bigoted minority it's there the the we, the majority is now diverse intelligent decent people we're gonna have to pivot so i think really that's the only way from the bottom up yeah and, and it's not going to be a short-term solution in, in any means whatsoever you know we're, we're talking really long term here but equally if we thankfully have a democratic administration who are taking something like counter extremism so seriously then and, and you know and, and they they are genuine about trying to facilitate change and capacity to educate and to provide people with opportunity to get out of those spaces the more policy that's implemented by the biden government that deals with that sort of stuff for me it, is it i don't i don't believe that we kind of that there is this one line that people travel on that you yeah. If you engage in a conspiracy theory, you will become an extremist. And if you become an extremist, you will become a terrorist. I don't see that progression as being in that one route, and nor do I see it as being, you know, a, a, a guarantee of someone's journey in, in those spaces, right? But 
if you are dealing with those kind of end means and you're getting further and further up the line, regardless of if a person was going to go across or going to go up and down and, and gradually get to those different places, you are going to be dealing with some of the issues at the root of them. And you're also going to be dealing with some of the providing some of the mechanisms that challenge those narratives and discourses that lead people into those places. Yes, if you want to deal with it all, you're going to have to do with the socioeconomic, you're going to have to do the political knowledge and awareness, you're going to have to do media literacy, you're going to have to do an awful lot of stuff, right? But if you're at least if you're on the way to tackling some of the the harder end of these issues, they're going in the right direction. And if that is happening in the background, while we hopefully do have that continuation that you've just been describing there in the political spaces, then hopefully the two together will work. And there's nothing, you know, that I'm not trying to <laughs> create a movement by any means, but, you know, we, we've seen by nowhere near what it should be, but we've seen the power of something like Black Lives Matter to be able to reach on a global scale and to shout out loud enough that people who would never have been concerned with it prior have had to listen and go, oh, okay, so there's those grievances that do exist. You know, don't get me wrong, most of the population are just going to turn around and go, well, I don't care because it doesn't impact me or, you know, or what they're shouting about. And we've seen the problematic responses to Black Lives Matter and and we've seen the, the, the lack of government response to it and the problems that that caused. But what we have seen is a movement that was able to take off, gain international traction and be heard when they were shouting, not in the ways that we might have wanted them to politically, but in terms of engagement with a wider public, we've seen that happen. And for me, that does give us some hope for the bottom up approach where people are going to turn around and say, actually, do you know what? I'm not going to accept this anymore. And I am going to see what I can do in my local space to help challenge some of these. And even if that is on a one to one basis, you know, someone engaging with their child and saying, I'm going to sit down with you and we're going to have a look at some of these headlines and we're going to try and deconstruct them. We're going to try and challenge them. Do you, you know what's wrong with this headline? What's wrong with this? Even at that individual basis, that is making a huge difference to that individual's ability to re sorry, to recognize fake news, to recognize hate and hatred and to recognize problematic views that have the potential to enable not only that individual to end up in these spaces but to enable this wider discourse of just hatred and ethno-nationalism and poison that we're seeing yeah. in the mainstream now not even in the extreme yeah great 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 points because i really think it's it's it is really a boat up we need an institutional approach as well as uh a kind of a movement level groundswell in which, because like you said, I'm glad you brought up Black Lives Matter because it really, it was, there was such a powerful moment, especially last summer before it got propagandized by other forces. Um, there were people, there was a huge re-education about racism in America and about, and, and that's, and that really tackles within itself the extremism, uh, the, the white supremacy, right? The white supremacy aspect of extremism because it really can debunk, begin to debunk, begin to discuss privilege. Those are counter extremism on the white supremacy front. But then exactly. there's also that, that untapped side, right? Where there's a conspiratorial thinking side that leads you to these other, these other conspiracy theories that isn't being addressed. And I think you're spot on there because if, if we have a, a, a era in which everyone is taking responsibility for that, that we are in this in this place, and that there are these conspiracy theories being thrown around, and there is this bigotry and this extremism and this racism, then we might be able to have that instance where, like you said, people where it's just in their families helping to create an environment where people might not fall down that path, and and essentially when you just have a a broader societal approach where this is just something that is this is just acknowledged as a problem, you know in a way that I think the Biden administration is doing, and there, it takes government investment, it takes the time to really uh, address this head on, we, we could see positive steps being made. I mean, I, I'm hopeful. I mean, I know this series, we've talked a lot about all the problems and some of them are such seismic challenges, it's hard to really tackle. But I mean, I think just the broader awareness of all of this and the fact that we're all just, everyone's taking it so seriously now and, it's kind of a new a paradigm shift is happening where I think people are able to now reconcile uh, the problem, the fact that 
our history is scattered and all of our global history is not great and humans have been kind of not awesome for a lot of our past uh done some pretty terrible things but like we're, we're, we're growing and we're learning and we're, we're I, I think that's just that broader approach um and trying to you know kind of tamp down on this grievance politics I think might broadly have a, a positive effect I think it's obviously those are just you know kind of broader cultural shifts that need to happen but I really think those are some of the most powerful you know yeah exactly and and you know we're not going to get to a point where this is solved until we have the buy-in and we have the support and we have the resource from government level but equally we cannot wait as individuals and, and and i mean that as an individual as me as a human being but also me as an academic and me as a, someone who is you know involved in car in trying to engage in the public in this space as well me as all of those different heads and, and other people who are, you know, I, I mean, everyone on an individual basis, whatever field you work in or you, you find yourself within, until we cannot sit around and wait for those government shifts to happen. We can encourage them, we can, when they come, we can engage with them, we can critique them, we can try and make them better. But the governments are almost two steps behind constantly. And we're, we're only at a point now where radical right is is starting to come and uh, to a, the awareness and people are thinking oh okay we, we need to do something about this now actually because we're starting to see the, the 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 hard end of the impacts of some of this stuff and i think the biggest issue that we've got with conspiracy is that we wait this we do this exactly the same thing and we wait far too long to start challenging it and you know these conversations are happening with people like yourselves and and with you know people who are involved in car and they are starting to come to the forefront but they're happening with us because we're aware of what's going on and we're engaged in it we're interested in it as phenomena that we want to try and deconstruct and understand and and you know at the end of the day challenge and counter but we are in a minority and until we start creating accessible means to engage with others to for them to recognize that this is happening and for them to then act on an individual local basis to do the same with others we're, we're not going to be able to deal with a problem because the, the government are two steps behind and yes we need them but we also need to act on an individual level to try and push the government along to recognize that for, for me radical rights still hasn't been dealt with it's still a huge issue we're still facing challenges with it we still need to do an awful lot in that space but we need to be acutely aware of the links that conspiracies have to radical right and what we now need to do with them to make sure that we don't end up in a space where those two things are just feeding each other and out of control and we don't know how to separate them and stop them. And that for me is a, a big concern and where we need to start paying more attention to, as I say, on an individual basis, on a government basis, but also you know, from an academic perspective as well and, a, and an activist and a researcher perspective and, and a media perspective, we need to start shining the light on conspiracy more and find out more about it to be able to disrupt it earlier and not let it get to the place that, that radical right extremism in all its kind of umbrella everything that's involved in that has just super spot on i think you know that's why this partnership a good nice moment to plug this awesome <laughs> partnership that we have between Rand and Carr, where i mean it's it's just what one thing i knew you know growing up and why I even pursued this with my with my co-founders and, and friends is really because if people don't understand how things work, everything is a conspiracy. That's really what it comes down to. And you brought up education. We brought up uh, just the cultural knowledge of, of what's going on, how that what what conspiracy theories are proliferating. You know, if you don't see if you don't know what to look for, you're going to easily be taken in. And that's why it's so important to have media organizations and academics and elevate the researchers behind this to, to present uh, coherent and accessible uh, methods of how to deal with this personally, how to spot this, the tactics that are being used for recruitment. How, like when I saw a pandemic uh, last year, I, I could immediately spot a thousand conspiracy theories I've seen for centuries. You know, like you just, if you know how conspiracy theories work, if you know how cons how racism is inherently conspiratorial, anti-Semitism, you know, there's a big problem with anti-Semitism currently where people don't yeah. recognize, like people just don't know that they're repeating something 
that Hitler said, you know, like they don't know it, right? Because they're, they're not aware of the history. There's exactly. not a cultural knowledge of the, if you keep saying Jews control, Jews control, Jews control X, if they did, they wouldn't have, they wouldn't have went through the Holocaust. All right. Number one, I don't want to go, I don't want to start a, you know, a rant on that front. Cause I'll be, I could talk about my frustration with anti-Semitism until the end of time. But point being all of these, all of this is linked. There's just, it's, and I'm really glad during this, this talk, we talked about so much about education because that's just the core of it. People don't understand how, they don't know the history. They don't know the intricacies of, 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 how, of how these radical right narratives have, they're just, these are just reincarnations and repeated repackagings of age old tropes and nonsense. That's what the radical right, and that's what these conspiracy theories, especially anti-Semitism, bring to the fore. It's just the same old, and you can read them in Hitler's speeches, and he'll say the exact same thing that you might hear in a clubhouse room on, on the on the app and here on social media. So, I think you're right. It's just there's so much to do. Uh, the, the government can only do so much. It's up to individuals, nonprofits like your uh, awesome org, Car. Media companies have to take responsibility to play their role in it and not just uh, perpetuate these extremist views. And I think if we have a whole society approach, we could get this done. Yeah, and it's not gonna be easy, but I do genuinely believe that, it, that we can get to that point at some point. I don't know when that point will be. I don't know how long that journey will be and who, how much it's gonna take, but I, I do believe that. And, I, yeah, I think for me, which is why full circle right back to my, my PhD work, that was why for me understanding how that conceptualization of threat and how we go about countering it in, in the education system was so important because for me that is the cornerstone of understanding how people go about trying to engage with all of these challenges and how people who face some of those challenges themselves and then engaged with and the education sector is the the ability and the 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 means by which we can help those people who have got to that stage and prevent those as many people from getting to that stage as possible with that blanket of just gaining giving them the tools that they need to navigate the world that we now live in and not allow them to be exploited by these individuals who are getting closer and closer and closer into the mainstream very well said well um, again, we could talk for another three, four hours, but luckily you're going to be back uh, for our panel that we're going to be doing. This is, we're going to do the final in the series uh, here. And thank you so much for coming today, Natalie. This was an awesome conversation. I had a lot of fun, even though we talked about dark topics, but we, we have some, we had some hope in here. So that's, yeah, that is, that yeah. is. Cool. And thank you very much um, and i've really enjoyed the previous episodes and i'm really looking forward to our next one with the round table with everyone um thank you very much for your time it's been wonderful awesome thank you and thank you everybody for tuning in